Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well today. Uh, we'll go ahead and um, get started. My name is Linda Kellum. I'm the, um, uh, I help do the technical support and run um, the NCLA government resources sections help. I'm an accidental government information library and webinar series or help for short. Um, and thanks for coming for today. Uh, you can see information about the GRS uh, section on our website. The links are in our chat box. Um, Government Resources section of North Carolina Library Association is a, a great group to, if you're in North Carolina and like to get involved. Um, but you can also support us through our YouTube channel if you um, want to subscribe to that and learn more about all different kinds of topics um, related to government information, um, including a, one that might be interesting to people who are come, attending this one today is our last webinar called Your City, Your Issues, Civic Engagement Workshops. Um, so th this was a really popular one and, and might be helpful for um, people who are interested in doing civic engagement workshops. And it's very um, timely and relatable topic. topic. Um, so, so today, today's webinar is facts and helpful tips about the FAFSA and DREAM app, app applications. And Itza Villaboy is a writer, library science student, and staff member at San Diego City College. She's the chair of Libros, a nonprofit library services and resource advocacy organization serving the San Diego, Imperial Valley, and Border region. And we're very excited to have her today to talk about this topic. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you very much, Linda, and thank you to the North Carolina Library Association for this really great uh, webinar series. Um, like, um, as Linda mentioned, um, they're I have a little nervous about technical difficulties this morning, so I'm, I'm keeping the slides at, at, you know, to a minimum and I'm working directly on the whiteboard and I will be sharing um, some links. So um, today, well, to start off with, I, I wanted to share the agenda, today's agenda, and... So today's agenda, um, you know, we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, the workshop and workshopping this workshop and the introduction to FAFSA and DREAM Act, uh, challenges students face, and the role of the Financial Aid Office Dreamer Resource Center. And um, I'd like to set aside 15 minutes um, for Q&A. It, it, it can be really easy to... Um, get into all the information and there, there is a lot to discuss. So um, I'm gonna keep an eye on the clock. Um, but um, again, I wanted to welcome everyone today and thank you so much for joining us either this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I, I have taught, I have, con I have conducted uh, financial aid workshops for several years um, from multiple perspectives and formats and I find, I've learned through experience that the PowerPoint presentation format isn't exactly, it, it hasn't worked the best for me, if only because there are students, parents, staff, they, there are a lot of questions, there's a lot of information to process. So I've developed a habit of starting the first 15, 20 minutes of any presentation by taking down questions and then I answer them one by one and it in the end um, everyone learns together but this is my first time presenting to the library community specifically you know um, on this subject so um, I appreciate the challenge and the opportunity um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit of reading first and then um, we'll get into some of the links and the application itself <clears throat> thank you so um, as I mentioned, I, I have been conducting financial aid workshops um, for several years from um, multiple positions, different positions over um, you know, a period of time at different community college campuses, including EOPS, uh, financial aid, and outreach. So I have um, conducted these workshops for students, for staff, and uh, for parents specifically um, on and off campus. And, um, many of these workshops have uh, have taken place in a library setting because of the access to computers, printers, and you know friendly staff. Um, and, and you know we have this large space. So um, 
over the years, or you know, in my studies uh, as a library science student, I I have become increasingly interested in this this crossover or these these overlapping worlds between you know how a student matriculates, how how a student gets through college, stays in college, completes college, and the you know various um, streams of support that are available either through academics or through um, student services, uh, which is primarily the classified staff. So um, this webinar is an opportunity to, to, to bring some of these worlds together. And um, so, and also I've noticed that over time, I've, I've been receiving requests for information from public librarians. Um, and I have fulfilled them on a one-to-one on -one basis or through small teams. But um, again, this webinar um, appears to be a really great opportunity to reach a larger a community. Um, and then one more, one more item before I get into the workshop. Uh, another inspiration for this webinar is the Book to Action grant that Libros and the San Isidro Public Library was awarded um, in 2020 along with 26 other book to action programs that will take place at 55 library locations across California. So book to action is a framework that takes the basic book club concept and expands it to create a dynamic series of events for adults and intergenerational groups. Librarians work closely with a community partner to develop a series of programs. Community members read and discuss an engaging book on a current topic attend author or speaker events and put their newfound knowledge into action by participating in a community service or civic engagement activity related to the book. The California Center for the Book is a program of the California Library Association supported by supported in whole or in part by the U.S. Institute of Museum and Library Services under the provisions of the Library Services and Technology Act administered in California by the state librarian. So based on personal family and lived history, professional interests, and an eye toward the populations we serve at, at the college where I work um, and the library where I intern, I chose the theme Transborder Communities and a book of poetry by Omar Pimienta titled Album Offenses, which was published in 2018 by Cardboard House, House Press. Our activities have included conducting FAFSA and DREAM Act workshops for students, book drives for children in crisis project, author readings, art workshops with youth, and a community cleanup. Prior to the pandemic, we were scheduled to partner with the city of San Diego on a large scale community cleanup of the Otay Tijuana River Valley and art workshop series. The program was canceled due to the pandemic. Uh, we are continuing on with our program series through the Dreamer Resource Center at San Diego City College to bring authors and organizations to campus and this webinar will be shared as 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 part of you know one of the features of this program series. So thank you for staying with me. I that was a pretty long intro. Um, so for the workshop today, as I mentioned, um, the workshop is typically conducted on a Q and A type basis, but um, today we're just going to go straight into the applications themselves. So um, briefly. To introduce the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid, or the you know, FAFSA as the acronym, is the first step in the financial aid process. Students use the FAFSA form to apply for federal student aid, such as grants, work study, and loans. In addition, most states and colleges use information from the FAFSA form to award non-federal aid. The California DREAM Act is the financial aid application for students who meet the non-resident exemption requirements under AB 540. So those are, we have two different applications um, on the agenda today, and we're going to take a look at both of them right now. Um, let me see. Uh, sorry, here's my desktop. And so here's a link to the California Center for the Book. It's the Libros website um, where, I'm, where I'm the chair. Uh, we, we are the local chapter of a national chapter called Reforma. And we are reforma.org. 
Okay, so the here is the application, the online application for the FAFSA. Now, students can find this, this application at fafsa.gov. Today, um, we're going to use the PDF. So this is, you can find, easily find the, the FAFSA application by Googling uh, FAFSA 2020-2021 PDF. Uh, we encourage the students to use the online application because it's faster and um, it's, it's automated. Many of the programs are automated to be processed as soon as that application gets to the campus. So, but this is what the PDF looks like. And sometimes, you know, you're going to have students that have limited access to computer services. So if it comes down to printing out a FAFSA application on paper and filling it out by hand, that is still a possibility. Um, so I just wanted to share that this is what the application looks like for the fall 2020 semester. Now, uh, these applications are released typically about a year in advance. Um, so they're, they're always released October 1st of the prior year. So this application was released on October 1st of 2019. The, the campuses will start process, are starting to process them now in preparation for the fall 2020. So um, a few of the features of this application are you know you're gonna have you're gonna start off with some you have some information here about how to fill it out there are some state guidelines and deadlines that need to be observed depending on where you're um, joining us from and that information is here i recommend looking at the pdf anyway just i have one always at my desk um, just to for quick reference and um Here's some more information about how to fill out the financial aid form. The most important features for today, um, because again, there's there's a lot of information we can get to, are you know, and and this is this is a concern that we share, you know, with librarians, library service, and you know the the mission of you know our college is that students are are completing these applications with accurate, um, consistent information that, and, and with the, with that, that these items will be um, processed efficiently and um, expediently. So it's really important that from the start, the, the student can develop the confidence to, to know how to fill out this, to fill out these applications. So starting really with a, with the name the issue with the name given um it's not just the length of the name but sometimes students have more than one last name and these these applications are not customized for that so um it's really important that we remind our students that if the the name must match what's on the social security card if there's any deviation from the social security card, the student will run into some issues. So that includes if they, you know, maybe they have nicknames like junior or um, there's a family name that they, they're, they ref, they're referred to that's, you know, not on the social security card and they will put that on the FAFSA, that will cause delays because there will be, these applications are fed, you know, to the Department of Homeland Security, the Social Security Administration Office, and other government agencies. So at any point in this process, if there's a discrepancy in the information, that's gonna, it's gonna cause a delay. So first and foremost, it's really important that students um, fill out the name accurately. Um, here's an area for the social security number, date of birth, all of this vital information. It's very important the student completes it um, accurately. Sometimes, you know, with, you know, completing these applications online, we run into issues of keystroke error and that happens, but more often than not, it sometimes comes down to a sort of personalized view of, you know, what, you know, how, how, how one refers to him or herself. Here um, you have vital questions related to citizenship, you know, to complete, to complete a FAFSA, you must be 
either U.S. citizen or permanent resident or uh, fulfill um, one of the visa criteria there. There's only so certain visas that are um, eligible to uh, complete a FAFSA and, and that includes uh, asylees, um, asylees and refugees. Um, but for the most part, it's for U.S. citizens and permanent residents. This is the area where they would enter their alien reg registration number. And these, these, the next set of questions are designed to continue to determine, um, you know, eligibility for students, including state of legal residence. That is a big one. Um, you want to, students may ask you, you know, what, what that might mean. Perhaps they were living in another state last, you know, the, the prior year, and now they're currently living in California. These are very technical questions and do um, determine eligibility for the students. So um, might you might get reference questions related to puzzling through how one determines residency. Um, and in that case, it's typically best, um, unless the answer is immediate, it's, it's best to refer to the admissions office where the student is planning to apply to because they have they'll have a registrar, they'll have someone there to help guide the students specifically about um, residency policies and guidelines. Um, the selective service questions, um, those, you know, that'll come to bear. Um, it's, it's become, uh, it's, it's received a lot more attention in, in uh, these last few years, uh, given the, the question of gender. So, um, Males are males between the ages of 18 to 25 are required to sign up or to register for selective service. Um, if you know, in the past, typically these these were um, these registrations happen during you know like a civics course or the forms would be available through the U.S. Post Office. Um, many students don't know that they need to register for this. Um, if the student leaves this area blank, the application, they will, they will um, default them to mail and request a registration for selective service. Um, if the student, uh, it, it's not making, there are no selections for uh, transgender students, but we have, um, we have encountered that and that's typically what the financial aid office will that's when we'll step in to to help out help the student out so um this next question the the drug question as it's called um often it's like um have you been convicted for the possession of or sale of legal drugs for an offense that occurred while you were receiving federal student aid the operative term here is were you convicted while you were receiving federal aid more often than not this the answer to this question is no. So, but just to give you some insight on that one. Um, the next set of questions are designed to determine eligibility. Um, if, if a student already has a four-year degree, bachelor's degree, they are typically not eligible for federal aid in the form of grants. So these questions are designed to figure out the educational level that the student is at, um, their goals, and um, whether or not they meet that criteria. Um, these next steps, depending on how the student answers these questions, or those questions, they'll determine whether or not they're gonna need information from parents. So here the student is going to answer some income information and that's for the 2020, 2021 year, they're gonna ask for 2018 income. And these section three, this is where you get into the dependency section. And if they answer, if student answers no to all these questions, then they must include parent information. And that's what this section is designed for. Once a student is able to say yes, then they are considered an independent student and only need to include their information. So, um, but in the case that a student needs to provide parent information, this is the, the section designed for that. And so this is where the parent fills out um, their own educational level, if they're receiving um, 
uh, aid from certain assistance programs, um, income information, and then the next steps are for, you know, de they're designed to determine where the student wants to send their information to, like the, the colleges. And that's where they include the federal school codes and or the school name and address. And then here's where either the student or the student and the parent will sign the application and send it off. So if they're gonna send it by mail, it's gonna, let's see, the address, I haven't looked at this. The address will be, address is here somewhere. Uh, sorry, it's been moved around. Typically when um, a student fills this out online, they will have needed to set up an FSA ID and that is, that is basically a, a kind of electronic signature that they will use to sign in and out of the FAFSA and then ultimately sign and send it off. So um, those are the bare bones of the FAFSA. And a couple of comments about it is it's, it's my role in the office is, is, is typically one of reference. So I, I, I answer questions, I help the students puzzle through pretty complex government and, and institutional uh, guidelines and procedures. You know, I, I assist them with establishing criteria for determining financial aid eligibility. Um, you know, the financial aid office uses applied methodology to determine eligibility. It's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of steps that students go through. And so there, there are many challenges for them um, while they're going through this process and typically it, take, it can take a full year for a student, and in my opinion and in my experience, it can take a full year for a student to really get a grasp of the entire financial aid cycle. So um, it's, it, it is a learn, there is a major learning curve to it. it. It's something that they have to master on the early end because it will determine, or it, it will, help to determine, you know, the success of how, you know, entering school, staying in school, being supported through school. And so it's very important that they, they can grasp um, a lot of these concepts in controlled language and the information that they need to provide in order to fulfill, you know, the financial aid process. Um, I'm gonna go to briefly to the DREAM Act application. And that's, so same as the FAFSA, there is a, a PDF available online. Um, the, the web address for the um, application, you know, it's uh, csac.ca.gov. And um, here again is more information about who is eligible for, to complete the DREAM Act. The important point here is to remember that students will not complete both a FAFSA and a DREAM Act. The DREAM Act application, the FAF, those, those are two different applications and the DREAM Act application, um, it has its, you know, its eligibility criteria listed here and it can be, it can be a, co complex. Um, I am not a certified registrar. I, I have to, I am not allowed to advise on uh, residency. I can only provide point to the guidelines, and I typically, um, I again, I, I just help re refer the students to the guidelines and then and or to the admissions office because that's where they have um, technicians designated specifically for these really complex determinations. So um, that's what I would advise. If, if you were asked at the reference desk, what to do is to, to help the student locate the registrar or the, the designated staff for determining residency because it, it can be quite complex. So if you're working in California, this is, this is specifically an application for our um, DREAM Act students. And um, so, On um, what we, we I mentioned earlier a little bit about AB 540, 
and that refers to uh, an F an affidavit. This 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 on October twelfth, two thousand one, Governor Gray Davis signed into law Assembly Bill five forty, adding a new section six eight one three zero point five to the California Education Code. Section 68130.5 created a new exemption from the payment of non-resident tuition for certain non-resident students who have attended high school in California and received a high school diploma or its equivalent. Over the years, eligibility requirements have been expanded. AB 540 is often referred to as the AB 540 affidavit or the California non-resident tuition exemption. Now, um, this affidavit looks like this and it's accepted so this one's specifically for the community college district and it's accepted at all the california community colleges and so a student a high school student typically would need to turn one of these in to the admissions office and it would ideally it would need to be in place prior to the DREAM Act application. Because all of the, you know, eventually the admissions application is gonna to need to match up with the FAFSA or the DREAM Act application in this case. So it's really important that students are aware that they need to fill out this affidavit. And typically the high schools receive um, and know about this information. So um, this, this would be applicable applicable is um, in particular for maybe school librarians if you know th this would be a, a good reference point for them but this is what the that affidavit looks like and then here's a link for um, more information about AB 540 and it's also offered in Spanish um, and so I encourage you know at some point you want to return to take a look at these so that, take a look at this information so that you can um, assist your college students, you know, on their immigration status. Uh, many, many colleges have um, what are called Dreamer Resource Centers. Um, this is ours. We, these, these, um, these centers assist students with, um, you know, any questions that they might have, they, they support them in various ways. Um, including um, they can have one-on-one -on -one consultations. There's the opportunity for um, to engage and support, you know, un undocumented students in various ways. There are referrals to immigration cons consultations, and the Dream Act is the Dream Act application is just one of the ways that the, the Dreamer Resource Center, you know, helps, you know, helps out their students. So um, where is okay? So here's the Dream Act application. And again, this is the PDF. It's a shorter form, um, and typically, this this application is directly connected to state aid. So the ability to help students waive um, their tuition fees and perhaps be eligible for Cal Grant. And um, Cal Grant is um, typically it's it's a competitive um, uh, grant from the state of California. Um, there are three different kinds of Cal Grant, Cal Grant A, B, and C. Depending on where the student is going to attend school, um, we will, the financial aid office is charged with determining which Cal Grant can be applied. Um, so same as the FAFSA, there's some introductory, introductory information. Um, and again, it's very important that some vital information is captured um, because this, Again, these applications are fed through various government agencies, again, including Department of Homeland Security, um, Social Security Administration. Um, and so information must match what's, what is on record. So um, this is where the student will you know, have their name, um, determine if, if, depending on how the student answers these questions, they even put a stop and direct the student to the FAFSA because you know, many students will think that they need to complete both applications or perhaps they have, they're operating under some inaccurate information and they might complete one or the other. Um, again, anytime a student has to go 
back into the application or change something, it, it can create a delay. So we really, we really focus on trying to get the students to complete the correct application the first time with the accurate information the first time. Um, and so here it's going to ask about marital status, dependency status. So these are questions that you know, verbatim, like the, how the student answers these questions will determine whether or not he or she needs to include parent information. Here's some information about who is considered a parent. Um, and this, this information tends to get updated, um, in my experience, every couple years because of the changing nature of, um, you know, relationships. And so, <clears throat> Here um, is where they capture the income information. Same as the FAFSA for the 2020-2021 year, they're going to ask for 2018 income. And um, these are more questions about assets. These, these are questions about services the household might be receiving. Um, and then here's student information asking pretty much the same questions, but from the student's perspective. Um, and then it's basically a sign and submit. So the DREAM Act application, what, what you're, you're gonna fall, <clears throat> what students will fall, have some issues with um, signing their applications. There, we have students that, let's say, are eligible to complete a FAFSA, but it's possible that their parents um, either don't live in the country or they do not have social security numbers. So the way that they sign their applications, it, it could be a manual process. The FAFSA permits for um, a, a signature page to be printed out at the end if the student's parents cannot sign with an FSA ID. Um, the DREAM Act application affords them to do it online as well. So. Um, these are, I know we just kind of, we really blasted through those, um, but um, those are the two, those are the two applications that the financial aid office uses to help the student determine their own, their financial aid eligibility. And it's really important that students file these applications, either one, uh, year to year because many different programs use the information called from the FAFSA to determine eligibility for other programs like scholarships or perhaps institutional funding, private funding, um, and the college itself will use certain um, criteria from the FAFSA to see, um, you know, who they can award, you know, these, these funds. So we, even if, um, for example, even if a student has a bachelor's degree, they're thinking of going on to graduate school, but you know, maybe in a year or two, and in the meantime, they need to take some classes to prepare for their graduate programs. In California, if they're eligible, they might be able to receive the fee waiver, which is now called the CCPG. And it's the most efficient way to process, to get processed for that is still to file a FAFSA in spite of the, the bachelor's degree. Um, because that process has been completely automated through the financial aid office. So as soon as we, we receive the FAFSA, we're going to check for that tuition fee waiver and apply it to the student's account so that they can um, receive that assist, assistance for the tuition. So depending on where you're joining us from, like what state you're joining us from, you might have tuition programs that will assist um, that can assist your students. So I, I am a big advocate for applying for, for students to apply for their FAFSAs and or, or, or the DREAM Act every year, so long as they are, you know, intend to be in school. Um, because one, it's, it's one less step that they have to take care of. Um, they might have to submit additional documentation. They might have to be verified. And all of those processes, that process takes time. So the earlier the, student, the students get this done, the better. Um, and um, once they're awarded, then they're awarded for that academic year and they don't need to go back to the FAFSA or DREAM Act until it's time to renew it for the next year. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so 
just a little bit about what the financial aid office does you know we are not we don't work for the government but we are there as a service to assist the student in this process so as a librarian you you, you are it's 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 great information to to point the student to the financial aid office if you know someone in the office even better uh, students often thrive from you know being sent to directed staff and um, we but we also we we share in this in this uh, concern for accurate and accessible and free information so yes the fafsa and the dream act applications are free applications we again we're not a government service but we are there to reconcile any discrepancies or contradictions or gaps in information in order to get the student um packaged for financial aid eligibility because if the student is missing any information, we, we can't go forward in the process. So typically, you know, the goal of, of these workshops is to, you know, enhance um, one's understanding of the FAFSA and DREAM Act applications. But the second step, and this is for students, is to actually get them to complete and submit the FAFSA form. So today we're not going to be submitting any FAFSA or DREAM Act applications, but these workshops are typically designed for that like so we would automatically just log on to a computer um, we, we, we would um, pull up the applications and I would spend the next hour or so visiting with each student to help them complete their applications and it has been you know proven in the past that you know libraries have been um, really helpful in this department because they have you know, lent us their spaces, they have shared their spaces with us. And, you know, that's typically where you have the majority of the computers on campus. Um, and so I, I'm very grateful for that. I've worked with many librarians to set up these kinds of workshops. So depending on the institution that you're visiting us from, like your role in this, it might be different from, you know, one librarian to the next, but I can assure you that, um, you know, in our capacity to refer, refer to students to accurate and accessible information, it goes a long way. So um, I, I know I know that was a lot, and I, just in case, I kind of I wanted to to stop there to see if we had any questions at this time, and if not, I can go on a little more, but um, I don't want to, you know, lose track of that. So. Um, do we have, okay, yeah. so I have got some questions here already in the chat. Great. So if you could, um, or I can read them or you can read them. Hard. Sure. Um, so the, does the DREAM Act um, application, on, is it only applicable to the state of California and how does it apply to other, other states? So the, yes, the DREAM Act application, um, we have it specifically here um, in California. Now, um, depending on, you'll want to be in touch with, you know, your state legislators, how they are handling tuition for non-resident students. Cause that, that's, that's where, that's where it, um, that's what it boils down to. It's like the ability for um, state legislation to accord um, policies to assist students that are of non-resident status. So we can, we might, um, this would refer to deferred action students, um, AB 540. So at this time, and specifically at this period in our time, I would advise you to uh, speak specifically to your campus registrars on the topic because the, the information does change. It's a bit of, it's, it can be, it's very political right now. So okay. I, I can only advise from the point of view of California, <laughs> put that way. Right. Yeah, so it would be best to talk to the, yes. the registrar. Yes, specifically the to the registrar, yes. Okay, cool. Um, and I, I think you answered this a, a little bit, but because um, one of the questions, oh, well, actually there's a question in the chat. Um, there was someone asking about, do, st do students apply every year for the FAFSA? I think we talked about it briefly, but. Briefly, yes, but it, no, it, it, it's a very good question um, because the, the short answer is yes. So long as a student um, is in school or is 
I, I say even thinking about going to school because the app, the, the FAFSA is, um, it's released so early, I, I advise that students apply for it every year. It's free, it can take 20 to 25 minutes to complete online. Um, depending on if it's the first FAFSA or not, the students just get better at it every year. Um, and, and I encourage them to send it to the campuses that they are thinking of attending. Um, one of the major um, thing, one of the major points is that, you know, students cannot receive federal aid at more than one campus during a semester. So for example, you can have a student that is attending a community college and a state college or let's say uh, a private college at the same time and a student can be receiving can receive state tuition assistance at the community college via the FAFSA and also receive federal aid at the private college at the same time during the same semester but the student cannot receive federal aid at both the community college and the private college at the same time. So it really, so the FAFSA is really one application to be reviewed for several different kinds of um, monies or you know programs, funding streams. And so this is this is intended to streamline that process, but it's just really important that the student is mindful of where the funding is coming from and you know the schools that it's being applied to. But yes, short answer, apply every year and early. Um, thank you very much. Um, is there, uh, uh, so David was asking, given the students have to apply or complete a FAFSA every year, is there a high percentage of students who forget to fill it out and miss out on financial op aid opportunities? I would say that, um, I think that they, they do forget or they are not, um, or access is limited or um, they get bogged down by the process. Honestly, like um, students, they might, get, um, they might get derailed at some point. Sometimes um, there are students that have trouble, you know, accessing their parents' information or, or um, that's typically the issue. But we have special populations of students that, you know, perhaps they are, um, they're foster youth or they're homeless or they have many challenges facing just completing an application, so they they do um, they do stop at some point for various reasons. So that's why um, you know we often have on and off campus workshops to raise awareness, to make the application accessible, um, and to guide students through this process because um, they might miss out on this on these financial aid opportunities. Now the what um, I can say is that, you know, the, the application is available, you know, October 1st of the prior year, but it, and, and then it closes June 30th of the next year. So for example, the current FAFSA that we are processing right now, which is for the 2019-2020 year, that application was available, was made available October 1st of 2018, and you have until June 30th of 2020, like literally 11.59 p.m. June 30th, 2020, to submit a 2019-20 FAFSA for this current academic year. So it's a long, it's a large, long window of, you know, in the period to access this application, but once it closes, it's, it's near to impossible to, um, Re reopen an application or to award a student for a previous academic year. So yes, we do miss students. So hence, um, you know, a lot of these outreach services that we try to provide. Great, awesome, thank you so much. And I, uh, you talked about how libraries can be involved. Have you done joint presentations with libraries or is it primarily that they help facilitate the ability to get into the, or to get students to come or? Sure. <clears throat> I have, um, a couple of years ago, I interned with, um, uh, at Central Library and Library Administration, and I did, they, they have a, a charter school that is in, that is like literally embedded in the library, and I, I have, I have assisted with, um, 
some surveys and programs, you know, establishing or, or supporting connections between public libraries and and higher education. Um, I've but I've not done a specific collaboration um, with the library community. Um, I and mean, this is my first this is my first one really. And and I'm I'm very inter interested in in doing that because um, there's a lot of overlap in our capacity for you know we're available as as reference librarians and you, there's a there are technical aspects to these applications um, there are outreach services to be fulfilled so um, I am looking at what you know what a mixed what what might be referred to as like a mixed use I don't know librarian like that someone that is fully versed in student services, but also functions, you know, with like literally inside the library as, as, as an information specialist, uh, uh, um, an information literacy and information specialist. So um, I, I am thinking, I am thinking uh, very actively in those directions. Yeah, that's great. And I think there would be a lot of interest, but at the same time, hesitancy on the part of librarians because of the technical, you know, aspects of it and taking someone down the wrong word. So I think it's definitely an opportunity for a collaboration. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. And um, I, you know, I want to offer my information, my, you know, my, 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 um, to, you know, you can connect with me and, and um, I, I plan to take this work on with, um, uh, with the MLIS, like I, I would like to do a kind of project at City College, you know, what, what, what would this position look like? What would these services look like? How would training manifest? Like I'm, 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 so I, I'm actively thinking about those things too. Great, thank you so much. Here's my email address. We're still on the browser thing. Oh, oh, that's it. Awesome, thank you so much. That's, that's it. Are there any other questions, Gunan? I think it too might be an interesting place to um, partner with some of the student groups on our campuses. Mm -hmm. In addition, you know, talking about, um, so I know some of our, some of the students groups did presentations on what it means to be a DREAM Act student and, um, and other kinds of uh, presentations like that. So it might be another way to, you know, have more of the inspirational aspect and then here's how you, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, there are many connections to be made between the financial aid office, um, the library, there are student groups, um, you can contact like student government and mm -hmm. you can create a, a network um, and, and really and share, share information and knowledge that way and, and develop programs specific to your campus. Mm -hmm. and that yeah. would be, especially in these times, like it, I think it would, it's, it's very impactful. Yes, definitely. All right, I don't see, let me check the Q&A too, just to make sure I'm not, okay. Oh, any more? Um, I think there was a question from Rebecca. Did, yeah. did my email address, was that shared for with everyone? I didn't, okay. Oh, it was only shared to the panelists here. I can, I can. Okay, thank you so it. much. Sorry. Yeah, it's, <laughs> the default is just a, for the panelists, so. Um, oh, I see, I see. So, awesome. Yeah, so feel free to get in touch with Itza if you have Yes, questions. please. Please. Um, and thank you so it, much. Of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if, um, of course, even to the extent if you want to provide feedback um, on this presentation, um, again, I, I know I, it's very DIY, but I, I um, typically, I, I really like to respond to questions because that tells me how, um, you know, the, the public is looking at these applications and, you know, what we can do to address those issues. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And thank you everybody for coming. Thank you yes. for the presentation. Um, thank you. Take care.